brothers and sisters, welcome to another word of Bible study. Bible study, what an awesome word to say. We are studying God's word. It blows me away that there are countries, there are people who can't even pick up the word of God, and yet we have at our disposal the unadulterated, divinely empowered Bible, the word of God. So what I need you to understand as we go through this, we've been talking about a topic that I know will set your life in another direction. It will send the trajectory of your life higher. I don't care what you're going through, and I mean, you know, we're living in a time where things are, you know, I guess people have always said, boy, things are bad right now. But we're living in a time that this Bible study is more crucial and essential than anything else. It may seem like going back to the elementary part of our walk, but we've been talking about living by faith, but not just living by faith, but putting your faith in action. There's one thing to say, I'm living by faith, and I'm a believer, and I know everybody else out there says, I have faith. But I want you to know something today. You're not going to make it without understanding how you grow your faith, how to put your faith in action. As always, I ask you to like our page, send out a share of this to someone else, there are people that need to know the only way we're going to make it is our faith and trust in God. So, let's have a word of prayer, then we'll go right into the study. Father God, it's again another time that we're depending on you and we're watching you and, and asking you to continue to bless us and help us through this study, God. It's another time that we know that you have brought us to this place. And since we're here, God, I don't know what people are facing or listening to me, but we have enough faith to handle any situation in our lives. Let them know we have enough faith. They have enough faith. And no matter what the enemy is doing or anyone else is doing, you have a reserve of faith and nothing is impossible if we can believe. So tonight, God, we're going to continue with our study on making sure we put our faith in action. Amen. Put your faith in action. We started with a very simple phrase that faith is like a muscle. It must be exercised to grow. You'll never lose your muscle, but you can become weak or you can become stronger based on how you take care of or how you work out your muscles. So if you try to wait until you come to something heavy, a heavy situation, and you begin to try to pick it up, but you've done no exercise of your muscle, no wonder the enemy is getting its way with you. No wonder you're losing instead of winning. No wonder you don't know or understand what real faith is. Faith has to be exercised. It has to be worked out. We can become weak in faith. We can sit here and be in church all our lives and can't believe God for anything. It's dependent on your intentional you got to make sure that you are, your intentional understanding that my faith needs to be built up. You say, Pastor, how do I know what my faith needs to be built up? Because you're constantly going through situations that may drain you, and the only way that you continue to replenish and revive yourself is listen closely to the Word of God. That's what this is. When you go into the Word of God, it's God's Word that will also give you that strength you need. Somebody listen to me. Whatever your need is, write it down. You have enough faith to handle it, but whatever your need is, you have to know, I've got to find faith in that situation to help me. Oh, I just said something, right? You've been saved so long that we get into these rote actions and these movements that have nothing to do with our deliverance, and the enemy can't wait till we get so weak that he can come back in and bring back the very thing that we overcame. You do know that one of the main modus operandi of our enemy, of Satan, is I will return. How will he find you? Are you standing on faith? Are you living by faith? And more importantly, do you put your faith into action? It is scary. Can I get a witness? It is sometimes mind-boggling to say that I'm going to trust this dangerous situation where I could die to faith. But I will tell you this, whatever we do in life is about faith anyhow. But you have to learn 
how to put your faith in God in action. What are you talking about? I'm talking about this. You have faith in your doctor. You take the medicine they give you. When they give it to you, you don't know what this man's mind, where this man or woman's mind could have been before they gave you that medication. But you got faith. I trust my doctor. Do you trust God? I, I said to a group, and I think it was in a sermon I was preaching a couple weeks ago, you have faith in going to the restaurant? You don't know what they're putting in your food back there. And you tell everybody, man, this restaurant's good. Come on. And you just eat them up. Yum, yum. Eat them up like it's nothing. When you know God is good, but you still have to put your faith into action. And when you don't put it in God, you have faith in something anyhow. How do I know? Just a little uh, review. We told you of the different kinds of faith. You got to go back and listen to the tape. But we talked about one of the most important ones is Romans 12 and 3. Never forget that text. It's like a foundation of what we're talking about. And that is, I have, you have, we have. The measure of faith. Listen, my brothers and sisters, we have the measure. What does that mean? God, in his infinite wisdom, measured out how much faith you would need for every situation in your life. It's measured out. And it grows it grows uh, proportionately to how we study and how we keep our hands in God's hands and how we continue to believe God. You understand what I'm saying? That the measure is in you. But if you don't grow it, if you don't put it into action, what good does it do? It's like having money in the bank, having a bill at your house, but not know how to put the two together. So now you get stuff cut off when you have the money in the bank, but you still have to go to the bank and access the money. That's what this lesson is about. How do I access? Yup, I'm telling you, I don't care what it is, you have enough faith to access. So Romans 12 and 3 tells us of that, what I call the first thing we need to understand. I have the measure. I got enough faith. And then how do we know that? Because of saving faith. That was the faith that you used to say, I'm a believer. Right? And we gave you scripture, Ephesians 2 and 8, that you understand it's by grace are you saved through faith. By grace are you saved through faith. Right? Meaning that you had enough faith to get saved. And as soon as you got saving faith, God said, now your faith can grow. And then we talked to you about believing faith. That's the faith you used the last time God did something in your life and you believed it. That was called believing faith. It's when you had to believe for something. And then we told you there's a gift of faith. That's a spiritual gift that you are obligated to take your faith. God puts you in the body with a gift of faith so that there can be faith in the body. You are one of the instruments he's going to use to make sure you encourage other brothers and sisters to use their faith. It's a gift of faith. Then we talked about not only the gift of faith, but we talked about the fruit of faith. Galatians 5 tells us that we have the fruit of faith. And then to top all of this up, somebody said, well, how much faith do I have to have? It's not the amount as much as it is the strength of it. You know, it, it, it's like... Even if I have a little faith, is enough to defeat the average situation, the, the average situation of darkness. It can defeat any demon. It can put me back in a place of having peace of mind. Anything that you do in your life can put you back in that position where you can have that kind of believing faith. So that's called mustard seed faith. Matthew 17, 20. Don't you ever think... That you don't have enough faith for that situation. I have the measure. And now, right now, all I got, because the situation is so overwhelming, is a mustard seed, a little. But how many know a little is a lot when you talk about God? So we talked about that, and we said we're going to study faith through understanding the most powerful book that's on faith, and that's the book of Hebrews. I started last week going through a little of it. We're going to actually get into it so you can see that Hebrews is that bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament, we had the law. And I talked to you about this last week. Quit saying that the Old Testament isn't important because I got the New Testament. Silly. I'm not even getting back in. The whole Bible is what we're supposed to be going by. But anyhow, the Old Testament was about the law. It was about prophets. It was about angels. It was about, it was about all the things God used to bring his, 
his uh, acts to pass, to bring his church, to bring his people to where he needed them. Well, we found out that in the Old Testament, many, many, many times, whatever God used with his chosen people failed. We are people that cannot keep the law. I can't do it. I don't care how saved you are. I tell people constantly, a lot of times the reason folk won't come to your church because the way you act is not really who you are. I just said something. We act like we're one thing because we think we're supposed to in that environment. So we come to church like I'm bold and I'm bad. But when you do that through this routine of making people think that you never had a bad day, you never messed up, you never failed, uh, you put this out of reach of the average person. The, this new generation trying to come into church, they're not going to sit there and listen to us in all of our perfection about our salvation. When you want to tell somebody, no, nah, there's some days, I used to be out there uh, in my BC days, I've been saved a long time, and don't think I still don't have to fight the urge to take a drink. No, there's some days when I'm over, overwhelmed, and don't think because of that, I don't have this urge to, you know, to run out and party. I don't have this urge to leave God and run out, you know, and, and do something sexual. Don't think that you're going to be so saved, you don't have to continually fight. And we even do that fight. Matter of fact, the Bible calls it the good fight of faith. That means every day you got to fight through something. Am I helping somebody? Because you may go to one of those churches where you think your pastor, where you think your apostle, where you think your bishop, where you think everybody is sinless. Not so. The, rich, the people who will tell you the truth are the ones that will tell you, I am so flawed, I am so weak, sometimes I fail, but thank God I got his word to hold on to. Do I got a believer out there and a cosign in the chat? Let somebody know, this is not easy, but by faith, I made it through some miraculous situations. By faith, I've seen God do things in my life that I never thought I could do. By faith, I'm living longer than I thought I would live. By faith, God has delivered me through some situations. So we need to go through what I'm going to do to get you to, of course, we're going to end in chapter 11, but I'm going to give you a summary of the book of Hebrews, uh, not a summary that I would do if I was teaching seminary, but a summary of you that Bible believers can grab and understand. So the covenant I told you, which is very understandable because what you need to know is why does my faith work? Why do I have access to miracles? Why am I sure God can raise me up no matter what I'm going through? Go to the book of Hebrews. And you'll understand this as we go through each chapter. So get your Bible ready, get your phone ready, get your device ready. We're going to go through and look at some of the uh, essential portions of that chapter to show you what God was doing leading up to Hebrews 11 and how this book was written. What we know is we don't know exactly who the author of Hebrews is. Uh, many people attribute it to Paul, but most writers believe, or most Bible teachers believe, or most theologians believe that whoever the writer was, whether it was Paul or not, they were very familiar with the Hebrew customs, they were very familiar with the Jewish customs, they knew the law, they knew about Abraham, they knew about Moses. So whoever they were, we know this person was steeped into, had a good understanding, and was trained and probably uh, educated in being able to expound on what the Hebrew traditions was. Then we know the audience that he spoke to was good because he spoke directly to them that they were probably Jewish and they were probably Hebrews because he spoke directly to them about things that were probably familiar to that community. All the things that I'm supposed to live by, they knew it. And that's why we know he didn't have to go back and rehearse. He was comparing the old which was not working, to the new, which works every time. Amen. So then we get into this book, and we talk about the covenant. They're completely different. Uh, it was a different approach from God. The Old Testament was the law, but the New Testament is faith. Say it again. Old Testament law, New Testament faith. The entire book of Hebrews, I can tell you, in one swift sentence, it's about understanding that we have a better covenant built on Jesus Christ. The law was built on the prophets God gave the law through, through Abraham, through Moses, through the prophets, through all of the priestly families. But now we have in one short sentence, my faith is better. I have a better covenant because of the fact that it's built on Jesus Christ. That's why this Bible tells us in every way 
every chapter, it talks about Jesus being better. Let's go to chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 is about the supremacy of Christ. The writer starts out letting us know that Christ was superior. He paints this wonderful picture of how he was superior to the angels because of his redemptive work on the cross. Jesus is the exact representative of the Father, and he communicates to us God's true nature uh, by God sending his Son. By understanding who Jesus is, what he said, we can know the fullness of God's nature and character. You know what that means? When I understand who Jesus is, then I understand the full uh, nature and character of God. Because if God would do what he did for his son for me, it lets me know there's nothing God will hold back. The devil is a liar. Whenever doubt comes in your mind that God wants to do that for you, or it's out of God's reach, this book of Hebrews tells you that's not so. Because God's nature is to make sure we don't fail, and when we because when we get saved and we walk into this new covenant, he wants us to be able to have power. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 from Hebrews chapter 1, which will give us an understanding of the superiority of Christ. I'm reading from the New International Version, so follow me. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, and many times and in various ways. I just told you that. He did various miracles. He brought up judges. He, he spoke to us in many ways saying, I'm still God. I'm, I'm going to save you. I'm going to deliver you. I can help you. But, but it says in verse 2, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. So then we know that that's talking about how the and a, a understanding of who Jesus Christ is holistically. He is God. He is part of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. In fact, he is God. Now, what we need to understand is Jesus fulfilled his role, his position as our Redeemer. Each one of the, each, everyone in the Godhead has their own particular provision. God is Father. He's the Creator. Holy Spirit is the keeper and the protector and Jesus Christ is the son and the redeemer, right? So we know that they all have a role. So what we have to figure out when it says he's the, appointed him the heir of all things, he also made the universe meaning Jesus Christ has access to everything because he is God and when he has access to everything, he's the heir of all things. Um, and then verse 3 said the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Everything is sustained by the word. After he provided purification, rest of verse 3, for sins, he sat down on the right hand of majesty. Watch this. In heaven. There it is. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was meant, that means everything was done to give you and I the power and right that we have, the right to sonship, the right to call on God and he show up, the right to also have supernatural power ourselves. The Bible says we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That means that we've been separated to do things other people can do. We can lay hands on a sick folk and they'll recover. We can pray for our own self and our prayer has powers. The prayers of the righteous avail much. All of that was done because of Jesus Christ. Somebody say hallelujah. It's settled. When Jesus said it's finished, quit arguing with yourself on whether or not you can do this. You can do it. I don't care what it is. And it's not by what you see. It's got to be moved and believed by your faith. Somebody holler back at me. I have faith. I have faith. Put something on that line. I don't know what it is. I have faith that God will help me get another car. I have faith that God will put my family back together. I have faith that this is not the end for my child. I have faith that I can recover from this last failure. Somebody have to say, I have faith. And how do I know that faith can stand? Because Jesus is superior. Let's keep reading. Because it says here, after he was sat down in the nasty heaven, verse 4, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. That's so simple. The reason I read it in NIV, because it's saying there is a name he inherited 
but because of his actions, because of him following the wishes of God the Father, because he followed the redemptive plan. It says in the book of Philippians chapter 2, we know this, that let this mind be in you that's also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery, we would equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and became that like a servant. He took on our nature. And then it goes down and said, because of this, wherefore God has given him a name that's above every name. There's a name you can speak right now. That demons tremble and run. There's power in that name of Jesus. We don't understand why there's power in the name. This is what the, this, this is what the words is that we said. There's power in that name. Every name that you can name has power. If you walk into a store, and this, whoever the family is that owns the store, when you go in, if Mr. Smith is the owner of the store, so you say, um, Bob Smith owns this store. And Mr. Smith looks at you and you say, Mr. Smith, I need to have that item right there. And Mr. Smith says, go tell the clerk to give it to you. What he said was, I'm sending you over there to get the things you need in my name. When they ask you, who said you can have that? You say, Mr. Smith did. That name automatically takes away any denial, any other right to me not having the merchandise. What I'm trying to tell you is when you speak the name of Jesus, the Bible says every tongue must confess, every knee must bow to the name of Jesus in heaven and things in the earth, under the earth, and in heaven. Meaning that everything on every realm bows down to the name of Jesus. Sometimes we miss out on our deliverance because we say Jesus so much, we forget what's in the name. When I say there's power in the name, what kind of power? Redemptive power. What kind of power is that? He got up with all power in his hand. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. When I say Jesus, I'm not just saying a name. Sometimes I, I get upset with my Hebrew brothers who have this new religion, you know, the black Hebrews, and they want to take everything back to a cultural perspective uh, and try to make sure that everything, you know, I understand that there is racial um, that there is definitely identification that there's black people in the Bible, and I know we've been denied that, but that's not something for you to build a religion on. Yes, educate yourself with that. Oh, I'm getting in trouble right now. But understand one thing. You have to follow what God laid down as the godly principle and the purpose, and he said there's power in the name of Jesus. So the power is in the name of Jesus. Yes, I can believe you as a black Jesus and I'll tell anybody, oh, that's good. But the reality is, I need to get out of the races, get out of the, get out of all of that stuff and understand one thing. The power in the name of Jesus is mine to possess and to communicate. All I have to do is speak that name. We know that's true because in the Bible, when we saw the miracles happen, how many remember the man that was laid at the gate beautiful and he had been lame? And all of a sudden, when Paul and uh, when Peter, Paul, Peter and John were walking through, and they said, um, he asking for alms, and they said, we don't have any money, but such as we owe. We, we don't have any silver or gold, but such as we have, we'll give unto you. Look at the next words. I don't have money. Money pales in comparison to what I do have. I don't have stuff. Pales in comparison to what I do have. But what I do have is the name of Jesus. And he said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the man took that, he had been lame, but all of a sudden that name brought a quickening into his spirit, and he rose up. But you've got to know, you have to believe there's power in the name. So a young lady today, I stopped to the store, and I, I hope she follows through and does what I told her to do. I saw her, and I watched her grow up from a child. And we were buying stuff, and she came over talking. I walked in, she's witnessing somebody, and I'm thinking, wow, here's a young lady that grew up in the church, and here she is now witnessing, and I knew some of the problems she had, but she started talking, and I'm saved, and I walked in, and she said, Reverend, you're supposed to witness where you can, aren't you? I said, girl, you doing it. And then she came over to me, she said, I was thinking about something, Reverend, just based on some stuff that happened in our past. She said, and I will tell you this. One thing my mom gave us kids was Jesus. 
And then she looked at me and said, and there's no better gift she could have given to me. Maybe mom didn't give you everything. Maybe dad didn't give you everything. But if they took you to church and introduced you to Jesus, if they told you about the power in Jesus' name, one of these days, you can't keep looking at Jesus and not be saved. I heard Denzel say in a speech that he was, uh, he was presenting a speech at a graduation, I think it was Harvard, uh, I don't know which one, but Denzel said, um, if you hang around the barbershop long enough, pretty soon you're going to get a haircut. I dare you. If you say, keep saying the name of Jesus long enough, pretty soon that name is going to enter into your spirit and you're going to cry out, what must I do to be saved? Want to, want, to get, want to get hit right here? Pray over your children and continue to use the name of Jesus. Pray over your situation and continue to use the name of Jesus. Even though they may be denying it, that name, that name, there's something about that name. And Hebrews tells us why. Because he has been created as superior to everything else. Let's look at chapter 2. So chapter 1 establishes that he's more superior than the angels in all the various ways that he came and that he, that God displays himself. In Hebrews chapter 2, this is, this is letting us know that we have a right. I'm giving you essentials for each chapter so we can move on. But in Hebrews chapter 2, he shared in humanity so that through his death, he might destroy those who hold the power of death. Oh, follow this. Jesus took on human form so that we wouldn't walk around being fearful of death because he made a way that when we walk from this side into glory, we walk right to the other side. Believers don't have to face death once they die to themselves and become born again. I don't have to worry about the death or a second death or dying and being in a place of torment and torture and don't have a reward. I don't have to worry about the horrors of death. That's why the writer said in Corinthians when he said, oh, death, where is your sting? No, we don't have to worry about the sting of death because we believe when someone's died who is a believer, we believe that when this earthly tabernacle how hello somebody has dissolved. We got another building not made by hands in glory. How do we know that? So I go from life to life. How do I do that? Because Jesus said, I died to make a way so you would no longer be held bondage to death. Look with me at Hebrews 2, verses 9 through 12. Hebrews 2. I, I, I stood on this text so many times when fear came. Uh, I stood on this text so many times when I was battling. And, and the mature Christians know what I'm talking about. Uh, somebody out there, you may not have been in a real battle where you walked into that heavenly place and you were wrestling between life and death. If you've ever been there, then you have to have something to stand on so the fear doesn't consume you. I'm, rec I'm recommending to you Hebrews 2. Verses 9 through 12. Listen to it. But we do see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Hand in hand, plan of redemption. He actually took death upon him for the entire world and definitely for those believers. He's tasted death. He made sure that death no longer had a hold over us. Look at verse 10, it tells you what he did. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through the whole, for whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing praises. So understanding and follow the entire plan, it says that Jesus, who is the heir of all things, created all things, tasted death for all of us. But now we found out that because of that, 
he made a way that we could continually be blessed and be saved. So I love this when it says, he, he suffered in our place. So when I live by faith, and there's a suffering because of sometimes cognitive dissonance, my nature fights against my spirit. Uh, my, my natural man or, or the humanity in me, the flesh in me is saying, this might not happen. And my spirit is saying, but God is able. And there's a conflict. Jesus died so that if I speak the word and have an understanding by faith that his death made it possible for me not to fear death, I can dispel any doubts that would come through the fact that he died in my place, right? Chapter 2 is powerful because it, it means that we don't no longer have to have the fear of death. Let's go to chapter 3. Each, each, uh, each chapter has a theme. This chapter is letting us know that Jesus is greater than Moses. Read 3. Hebrews 3 conveys the fact that Jesus is our faithful high priest who eternally resides in the house of God. It shows that he was superior to Moses and the covenant of the law. This chapter also serves as a warning against having a hardness of heart. But can we get into this? Read chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Let's look at that. Chapter 3. This is still the NIV. I'm reading from right here. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 3, chapter verses 1 through 6, I'm going to read, I'm sorry. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. The, the, the high priest went in to ask for forgiveness of sins, and he had to do it every year. Hebrews, the author is telling now the Jewish Christians, no, you don't have to worry about that. Fix your eyes on Jesus, who is our eternal high priest. Verse 2, he was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful to all of God's house. He wants the Jewish hearers, remember the audience, to understand that you guys worship Father Abraham and you worship Moses for what he did. You know the history of how Moses was able to bring God's chosen people out of bondage in Egypt. You know that. So we know that God commissioned and called Moses to do that. And he was, Moses was faithful to do that. Well, he's saying, but Jesus also has a greater honor because just as Moses was faithful, he was faithful for his task. Moses brought us out of Jesus, out of Egypt. Jesus brought us to a place where we're now worthy again to go back to glory. He brought us to a place where we're back into the, into the faithful family of God. Verse 3 says, Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of the house has greater honor than the house itself. Right? For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. This makes sense to you? He's saying, you can... You can Worship, there's nothing wrong with you celebrating what Moses did. Moses' faithfulness. Moses, you know, being 80 years old and going to see the burning bush. Celebrate all of that. But Moses is just an instrument that put God's people to a certain place of deliverance. But Jesus came, who is the builder and creator of Moses and of all means of salvation. He created the entire house. So, the, the things that are done are good, but the things can't be greater than the one who gave us the power to do the things. For every house is built by someone, verse 4, but God is the builder of everything. Verse 5, Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house. We are his house. If indeed we hold firmly to the confidence and hope which we glory. So he's saying, Jesus is greater than Moses because Jesus made a way eternally since we are the house. Moses helped us, you know, get delivered. He helped us get to where we are. But Jesus Christ helped bring us out for the total redemption plan. So what he's saying is, 
Um, you, could, you can't thank Moses for salvation. Jesus is the one who went to the grave and fought so you wouldn't have to fight for your deliverance. Let's go to chapter 4. Man, this is good. So we know now, I'm trying to show you why your faith should work. Stand, why you can put your faith into action. Chapter 4 is one of my favorite chapters because it talks about rest. In the law, it was hard to find a place of rest. As a matter of fact, you could not find a place of rest. Meaning that um, I would be good one moment. So the law say, you know, uh, bring your offering to the high priest. So I just gave my offering. Uh, bring your sacrifice. I just brought my sacrifice. The law says, get on your knees and pray. You know, so many times a day, I get on my knees. I feel good that I fulfilled all of that, right? But I got to do it again the next day. There's no rest. Once I come to Jesus, he offers us a true Sabbath rest. You know, when we talk about a Sabbath rest, we're referring back to God's creative plan in Genesis when it says for six days God created. And on the seventh day, or the Sabbath day, he rested. So once we get in Christ, we rest our doubts. We rest our fears. I don't have to go out and do this again tomorrow. All I got to do is live for God and I maintain my faith. Oh, and what's great about that is, haven't you had moments in your life where you know that your actions separated you from God? Come on, be honest. And yet, somehow, in the back of your mind is the potency of the word of God that says, he'll never leave me or forsake me. Or I hear a word that says, um, if I repent, I, if, I'm, if I repent, if I go to God and repent, he's faithful and just to forgive me of all my sins. I see this escape hatch so I can rest that it's not the end. If you messed up and, and you go back and look at the law, there were times when you messed up. There were some harsh penalties for that. Um, you remember when the woman was caught in adultery and the law, the Levitical law says, they ought to be stoned, right? I mean, there were some consequences for not living by the law. Jesus paid our consequences. Our best or our worst is based on how we walk with him and whether or not we repent. Come on, come on, listen to me. Sometimes your faith won't work, not because the faith isn't working. It's because you have that doubt of your uh, sin, that doubt of your unfaithfulness ruining your connection. It's not that it's not there. You got to get something out of the way to make sure you get that connection back. Somebody saying, well, God can't hear you. Um, hear sinners pray. Well, it's true and it's not true. Okay, James, you're putting yourself in a position here, but I need you to hear me. The Bible, when someone says to me, God don't hear sinners, well, it's true and it's not true because if God didn't hear sinners, nobody would be saved. The reality of thought, if you understand that text, it's not talking about God can't hear sinners. God is God. He's omnipotent. Um, he's all-knowing. Uh, he, he's all-seeing. He's, he's all-powerful, right? So God, the Bible means that when you pray and the prayer is not sincere because it's clouded by the sins you just did in your life, it won't get through to God and back to you with power. So it's not that God can't hear. It's the fact that when you know you have a sin that you need to fight through, and get control of at that moment. It will cloud your ability to get what you need from God. It's hard to say, God, heal me, and I know I've purposely been sinning for the last six or seven months, and now I'm in a life or death situation. It'll be hard for my mind to understand that, man, I gotta get rid of this purposeful, intentional sin then I feel there's a free path to my uh, prayer going to God. You know what I mean? And it's not living by the law, but remember what the Bible tells us. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Faith works because when I work my faith, 
That keeps me on a solid and straight path with God. If I pray, if I read, when I talk to him in the morning, when I get up, when I create this whole relationship, I got a clear path. But if I go out and commit adultery, if I go out and steal on purpose, and I continue that way, it means that that sin is blocking God from being able to bless and be here. But let's talk about that rest. So even with that sin, I know, if I get on my knees, he's faithful and just to forgive me. Watch what it says in, in Hebrews 4, 1 through 4, what gives you a snapshot of this chapter so you understand what it's saying. Therefore, since the promise of entering into his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had good news pro proclaimed to us, just as the children of Israel did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter into a rest, just as God has said. Watch this, this is so powerful. So I declare an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. Understand the text is saying, you fall short, not because of Jesus' sacrifice, but the Hebrew writer is saying, acknowledge your sins. Don't just continually walk in a direction you know is unpleasing to God and then wonder why your faith isn't working or your salvation isn't exciting. No, everything worth having takes work. Everything worth keeping is hard. I don't know why people try to make it so simple when they're talking about, well, all you got to do is live by faith, just believe your faith. No, this is work. My mind, my sinful flesh, the world around me, my senses, everything sometimes is telling me not to believe God. It's telling me this is better than God. But I can only enter to a place of rest as I rehearse in my mind who I am, whose I am, and what he has done. I can rest. Uh, you're about to be put out of your house. I know who I am. I know whose I am. I know what he's done. What does that mean? It means that my God has promised that the birds of the air and the beasts of the field don't sow a reap, and yet he takes care of them. God is saying that I will make sure your needs are met. There's my rest. But you got a, a eviction notice. Yeah, but I got some needs to pray with. I can call on God and I rest. So I said, what about if you pray and you still get kicked out of your house? I still rest, because I believe, here's how you believe by faith, What by faith, whatever God allows to happen in my life, if it looks bad for me, I still believe that God will work it out for my good. Have I got a witness? I don't know, God, this is a terrible season you have me in. This is a terrible place I am right now. But my faith says, Suck, trouble don't last always. My faith says, God is going to work this out. Somebody ought to be celebrating right now. I don't know how dismal or how bad your situation looks, but by faith, if you can see past that and look at Jesus and the redemptive plan and understand you can rest because God is going to take care of your problem. Let's go to chapter 5. We're rehearsing this book and we're going to end up in chapter 11. Now what we have the significance of everything that the writer was saying. Chapter 5, follow me, we're reading the Bible tonight. Somebody want to come to Bible study and you don't want to study the Bible, you want me to preach to you. No, I'm trying to expound on the text, but you have to see that word for yourself. When you get that Bible visually, you're sending a signal to your own brain, this word is important, you know? It's like getting ready to go through customs. Uh, my wife and I just came back from Israel not long ago. When we had to stop, we went from several places into other areas where you needed to show your passport and have your license. I can remember walking up to that line, finding my license. My wife tapped me, you got your license? I said, 
to make sure I put it right there. Come on, get your, get your passport out. They got to see your passport. Why did we do that? Because we understood at that moment how important that document was. I got to bring that document out. It's the same way if you're going to activate your faith. You have to know how important it is to keep your mind on Jesus Christ. Chapter 5. In this chapter, it gives a perfection of our high priest. Um, showing a better covenant. But this explains that the high priest um, was not as powerful, as perfect in his priesthood as Jesus Christ was. We're going to get into that again in chapter 9. So let's look at this, what it says in chapter 5. Let's look at verses 5 through 8. I love this. Hebrews 5, verses 5 through 8. So, verse 5 comes into a sentence in the same way. So you have to read up above to know he's talking about the priest, but then it says, in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son. Today, I have begun, I become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions, verse 7, with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. As he was heard because of his reverent submission, son though he was, he learned obedience by what he suffered. I love this. Anytime you are in the position of intercessor or in between, you're saying that I'll take on the pain of the person. I'm joining into the pain and the problem of the person I'm interceding for. You know, intercessory prayer, prayer warriors, uh, sometimes it, it's, it gets to the point where they actually feel the pain. If, if someone loses a child and they ask me to pray, and I have children, you pray better when you take that pain. My prayer is taking into account the tears, the pain, the loss, the confusion. When you intercede, you stand in that gap. The Bible tells us in verse 7, during his days of life on the earth, he offered up prayers, petition, and fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And because he did this, he made himself perfect because of the fact that he learned through suffering. We don't like suffering, but pain teaches me to love God more because the pain drives me to a source. Did you get that? Pain drives me to a source. That source is my relationship with God. Had I been fine, you wouldn't have found me listening to Psalms 91 in the morning, praying it again at lunch, praying it again at dinner. You know what drove me to that? Pain. And the offshoot or the byproduct of my pain is, wow, I see God better. I'm closer to God now. Somebody who lives in pain, who had to struggle to get somewhere, appreciates it more than the person who had it handed to them. Amen, somebody. So what happens, Jesus, who, who is God, said, I want to really feel what my people feel so that I can be their high priest who knows when I step into the gap for them and offer myself for their sins once in one time, that I'm doing it with the knowledge of how they have suffered. Jesus, I love this. Jesus said, I want to take part in your suffering. And there's another place where Paul tells us to take part in his suffering. Because it brings us to a place, suffering does, where all the pretense is gone. And now I have to speak from a position of pain. Let me tell you what suffering will do for you. You could be in a situation where, and I've been there, um, I had to present, I had to preach, and what I was preaching was the power of God, and how God would heal, and how God was 
gonna do this for you and lay hands on you. So the message God showed me that day, at the same time I'm preaching it, I'm dealing with a health issue that I've been praying for and I'm trying to keep myself straight while I'm preaching through it. Here's the good news. I learned from that experience and pretty soon the pain of that health issue no longer can hurt me because of the fact that I have seen Jesus, here's the word, sustain me through it. When Jesus sustains me through it, I come out on the other side stronger and better. Jesus is letting us know by example. I learned how to be your deliverer through the things that I suffered. We're going to see this theme again, over and over again in the lives of the greatest preachers and prayer warriors and saints down the years. You're going to find out the one running theme through all of their lives is as they were preaching by faith, they suffered. If I got a witness, where are my folk that know? I suffer, but I still speak good of Christ because in my heart, my faith is telling me my God's going to work this thing out. Faith can take you further if you put it into action. If you heard nothing I'm saying, this is my third uh, input into this series. If you heard nothing I'm saying, hear this. Your faith needs to be put into action. And it's not put into action if it's something you can do on your own. It's something you have to step out on and say, the word, my faith in God right here is going to hold me up through this situation. Uh, I'm going to close right here. We'll pick up with uh, chapter 6 next week. But let me give you an understanding of that. Um, I have a friend who told me to meet him in Philadelphia. He had a check that he wanted to give me a check I forgot to pick up when I preached. He said, come, really, man, at this time, I'll have that check waiting for you. The whole time I'm riding to Philly, I didn't, I didn't think, well, he has a check, is he gonna be there? I trusted that it would be there because my faith, I was riding up the road to meet him. He could have told me that and not showed up till midnight. But, I, but I, I had faith in the individual who told me that they were going to be there at 12 o'clock for my check, and he was there. If I was a negative person, I could have been, well, man, make sure you're there. I'm double checking. I'm not believing. And I could have missed out on something God had for me. Quit being negative. Put your faith in action. I'm living by faith. Are you? You only live by faith. When you've been through the difficulties that all you had was faith. This Pastor Duncan saying, come back next week. Listen, go to www.shilohbaptistchurches.org. One more time, www.shilohbaptistchurches.org. Our website, we're in the middle of fixing it, but you can still get there and see what we look like. We got our Instagram, SBC Praise Church. Um, same thing with Facebook. Our hashtag, SBC Praise Church. All one word. Don't get it mixed up. You'll get another church that's not us. I need you to share. I need you to like our page. I need you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can continue to get this kind of quality teaching. I, I preach, I teach and preach because I'm excited about what I'm teaching and preaching, but also because I'm living it. I don't try to sensationalize it because the word in God is sensational enough by itself. Let me close right now. Please share this message, and if you're going through a hardship, put these principles in action that you saw in the Word of God. Live by faith. God bless you. Have a good week. See you Sunday. You want to join us? We have one church, two locations. Mile and North Port Norris. Go online, and you'll get our address. God bless you.